I want to start us off with our first, one of the first uh, invitations that we have uh, here as an activation of the space and, and um, the sound and our presence of bodies here uh, in the exhibition. I want to maybe just chat with you rather than at you. For us, for Kara and I, working on this exhibition has been in a very special occasion of um, reflecting on our time here in Tulsa. And the exhibition, as we titled it, Strange and Oppositional, really um, sort of thinks through and with uh, black radical thinkers like Bell Hooks who you know, sort of did the uh, um, sort of foundational text of black aesthetics, strange and oppositional. Um, and I just want to read a quick quote from, from their book and as a sort of like foundation for us to, to think through the different ways in which uh, you know, I deal with black aesthetics in the, in the expo. Um, um, Bell Hooks states, black aesthetics is more than a philosophy or theory of art and beauty. It is a way of inhabiting space, a particular location, a way of looking and becoming. And I think for us, um, for myself as a subject, uh, you know, as an Afri uh, Afro-Caribbean person, um, really leaning into the legacies of, um, you know, I guess African indigenous people, indigenous people also coming from the Caribbean. Uh, this, way, this way of seeing is really talking about sacredness and um, finding sort of a beautiful poetics in the everyday, in the materials that I collect, in the materials that I use um, to make this type of work. Um, and maybe we can kind of like start right around here with this particular series. Tiger jaws are, uh, you know, succulents, they're plants that have kind of like this thick and fleshy, uh, you know, sort of leaves to them and they are triangular uh, in shape and they have this sort of like teeth-like, um, sort of, uh, you know, kind of textures around the edges of, of, the, um, of the leaves. And I think for me, it's interesting to kind of look at this particular work um, with a metaphor of sort of like having teeth in grinding. <laughs> and, and to me, sort of like part of it is because of the, in the way that I have sort of like shaped this kind of like particular sort of forms um, you know, for me, they sort of like re resemble some sort of like teeth um, in a sense, but they can also be, uh, you know, sort of representations or faces or, or, or even bodies in a sense, right? Um, and it's very interesting because this work kind of like manifested here in Tulsa. Um, and it is, um, it's taking materials that I, uh, have collected around Tulsa in my walks, um, specifically around um, train tracks, which is something that you cannot avoid uh, living here, right? Um, and for me, I think in thinking of um, train tracks and sort of like constantly crossing them here in Tulsa, I feel they are sort of like this place of liminality and a place of fugitivity. And, and in the way that I'm sort of like connecting to those concepts of sort of like liminality is sort of like when you're able to be in different places or you can occupy two positions at the same time within a boundary. And I feel that that's something that we're constantly navigating as we're here, right? I mean, right now, <laughs> you know, we are at 108 Contemporary, but in the sense, you know, we are also in the arts district, 
were also in what used to be the braided district, you know, after white supremacist architect of the Tulsa race massacre. But we were, were also here in Greenwood as well, right? And at the same time, we're also here on, um, you know, the specific territories of First Nations as well, right? So I think there is this sort of like constant navigation of consciousness that we have to sort of like move through as you are just sort of like walking around, you know, Tulsa, because it's an energy that is deeply felt. Um, and I think going back specifically to the train tracks, for me, these are, you know, uh, important because I know and learned of the history of the Tulsa Race Massacre, where a lot of folks actually were able to escape running through train tracks, right? So if you are sort of like thinking of yourself and thinking of the history of um, escaping, in a sense, there's this, this context of fugitivity in which you have to also constantly be navigating, where there is, you know, sort of this um, transformation of a space from being, you know, attacked, enslaved, enslaved, into a projection, into freedom, but you are constantly moving, right? You're constantly readjusting uh, your reality, in a sense. Um, so, some of the, uh, some of the pieces, a lot of the uh, organic and natural elements that I have here are actually uh, things that I collected from around the train tracks, whether they were sort of like organics, the twigs, you know, the sort of like, um, the sleeves of a, of a um, shirt or, or sweater. Um, so of the sort of like detritus that you find just sort of like in general here in the city. And it, to me, sort of like an important reflection of the material history and the textural history that lives with us here in, the, in, in this particular space and time, right? Um, there are also elements that I brought with me, a lot of the sort of like more yellowish elements that you see on some of this is actually soap, and a type of soap that I grew up uh, with that I sort of like carry with me. Um, and um, even some elements, whether some of the fabrics, some of the things I found here too, it's sort of um, this also kind of like history of migration in a sense and the things that you take with you, right? And I feel that it's interesting to find myself because I spend a lot of time in Virginia and in many ways having a studio there, I collected a lot of the, those things and I'm sort of like carrying them with me around. So even thinking of the migration pattern of, you know, folks that were removed from territories, you know, in the East Coast, Virginia, actually coming west, right, and landing here in Oklahoma, for me, it's kind of like a, you know, kind of like symbolic, kind of like even, and poetic kind of like way of, of, of thinking of how, you know, kind of like bodies move through space and time, and the different sort of like factors and, uh, you know, situations in which um, that is, you know, removal or, or or that is sort of like seeking something else, right? Um, so that is, you know, kind of like that, uh, the main sort of reflection for me in a way of commemorating then the folks that had escaped, um, you know, and sort of like think about um, their, their memories um, as they are, you know, sort of like manifested in this, sort of like um, face-like or, or corporeal sort of uh, shape. Um, I think with that, then we can move then to this particular area where we all are standing in. I think I want to discuss and this, the, the latest body of work, which are so not this kind of like ceramic pieces that you see around, which are titled Constant Strangeness, Buckets of Blood. Um, and they're, to me, they're sort of like interesting and maybe I sort of just talk a little bit about my relationship to brown paper bags and brown paper. Because I'm really 
into using non-traditional materials, maybe as you can see. And therefore I think thinking, I, I sort of like have always been drawn to the physicality of brown paper as I can trace, you know, as I can sort of like leave a lot of texture as I'm sort of like tracing lines on it. Um, but at the same time, I think there's sort of like this um, inherent quality of something that becomes some sort of like a receptacle as a referencing of a body. And as a person that has a brown body, I see a lot of kind of like echoing with what maybe kind of like a, a paperback in this case can stand for, right? And it is, it's interesting because I, I, it's something that is utilitarian, it's something that we find kind of like in our houses, you know, it's something that we use to kind of like carry things. Um, and at the same time though, it's, it's one of those sort of, um, uh, sort of, you know, kind of like things that we use and then we discard them until we need them again or not, you know, which is in some way also sort of like a metaphor in which kind of like the historical erasure of black and brown people, especially in this country, right? Um, so they have been for me, you see sort of like different iterations of sort of brown paperback works around here, but I'm really thinking of them as vessels. I'm thinking of them as actual sort of like, uh, you know, kind of like bodies. Uh, in space and with the ceramic element, the ceramic pieces here, I'm sort of um, thinking of this sort of Tulsa legend and uh, incredible story that I learned uh, here in Tulsa um, about a um, badass uh, a hustler named uh, Sadie, Sadie, uh, I'm not sure I get their name right, um, Sadie James, who I learned about from the research and presentations that Russell Cobb and uh, Apollonia Pina have done from their work for uh, the book uh, uh, The Great Oklahoma Swindle, right? Which is sort of a really sort of like eye opener history of Oklahoma in which there is a history of kidnapping, of theft, of land grabs, uh, mostly done by white settlers um, in order to, you know, uh, disenfranchise sort of like First Nations um, and, and their territories here, right? And as a sort of, you know, continuation of that type of damage, then we also see, you know, uh, the African-American community here also affected by it um, through the Tulsa Race Massacre, unfortunately, of 1921, right? So um, I have titled this uh, Buckets of Blood, and I mean, part of that, I mean, don't do this, but I am the artist, so I can. So each one of them, oh, this is good. I cannot, they have, they have the museum glue on them, but <laughs> Other than do have sort of like these red bottoms, which to me are sort of like super, you know, kind of like, it's kind of like a little joke of my own self about them. Um, just sort of like referencing this um, brothel that Sadie James used to own on Black Wall Street in the early 1900s. So that uh, Sadie Smith was somebody that had a lot of insight into the gossip and the tea of uh, Tulsa powerful. Um, and they were able through sort of, you know, sort of like this uh, kind of uh, venue as a brothel and, and maybe kind of like part of a, you know, a red, red light district sort of um, uh, kind of like condition and, 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 and place. They were able to have sort of a lot of, um, uh, a lot of influence. There were a person that had seven, seven husbands. There were black women <laughs> that had seven husbands. They shot one of them. So, you know, they had play. They, they knew, you know, they knew what they were doing. And at the same time, they were also um, uh, very much uh, sort of working and doing some detective work on behalf of some folks that had 
uh, we're trying to do some land grabs and, and, and take away and sort of, there's a really amazing history that if you, if you sort of hear the work of Russell, Russell Cobb and uh, Polonia Pina around um, Sadie James and, and the Bucket of Blood, um, where, um, you know, they eventually had to sort of like disappear. They had to sort of, you know, <laughs> navigate themselves out in order to protect themselves. Um, but I think for me, sort of in, in naming then this and also sort of like pointing about sort of this shape-shifting and navigation in which sort of like black subjects have to do in and out, right? Uh, and um, I think another aspect of the brown paper bag is, you know, this, this very racialized and violent test of the brown paper bag test in which uh, people were, um, you know, basically test, you know, to see where were they in the range of brownness and whether it was sort of like a tool to see if you would, you know, sort of like how black were you or if you pass as white, you know? So, so the, the, to me, even though I didn't, I um, didn't know about this test until I arrived here in the U.S. I think the same violence uh, and manifestation of violence through colorism is something that I experience as a brown body constantly, right? Um, so in some way for me, by sort of like using brown paper bags and flipping them, there is a sort of like reclamation of that history in which each one of these actual sort of like items become a unique gesture, a unique artistic gesture beyond sort of like the, the search for uh, one universality in which, you know, that bell is completely taken off. And we are sort of like in the presence of an actual um, uh, sort of like unique subjectivity, which is something that to me, you know, it's beautiful about brown people and black people, of course. Um, with that, then I'll take you to the back out here. This is also one of sort of like the last um, series of works that I have presented uh, for, for the exhibition. And they are jewelry pieces that are based off uh, actual brown paper bag works that I, that I have created. Um, the brown paper bags have been something that, excuse me, that I have uh, collected and brought into the studio and have them in baths of sugar, salt, soil, coffee, flowers for weeks and weeks at the time. And you see this materialization uh, in crystallization of uh, these items in a paper bag just like this. So this is a earlier work um, called Les Cadenuses, and this particular bag is actually replicated into this particular piece right here. And I have to definitely shout out uh, Rachel Daisy from Dylan Rose, who is, uh, a, a, runs a jewelry studio here, who sort of like helped me um, scan these bags and sort of like size them in order for them to become this, the pieces that, that we have here uh, from the series in the names of. Um, so that, uh, the main idea of this is how sort of like things kind of like developed, they first started, right? And I would actually have the bags in these baths that I mentioned of all these materials and then I would sort of like bring them out dry then sculpt them, and then they would come, they would become this sort of like pendants that I would then hand with chains um, on sort of like against the wall. And that, those pieces were called cadenuses, which that um, the inspiration from those, it's very interesting because they come from, there is this another mythological character, uh, very famous, <laughs> in sort of like, in kind of like, I don't know, Dominican consciousness, which is this sort of like immigrant that would leave out in, in out, you know, overseas and then would come back to the island 
wearing this kind of like really heavy like gold chains and like wearing suits um, instead of like, I don't know, imagine like, I don't know, the Godfather or, or you know, uh, Al Pacino coming, you know. Uh, so so those, those were sort of like really interesting kind of like characters that are part of the kind of consciousness of um, kind of, you know, I guess Dominican society in some way with people sort of like representing this, you know, kind of like, I don't know, you know, idealistic or sort of like aspirations. There's sort of like something about, you know, showing off, you know, what you have or, or some sort of like power that uh, in a sense when you're sort of thinking of, um, you know, communities that have been historically uh, disenfranchised in a sense, the, the fact that you're able to sort of, you know, kind of like claim a part of yourself, right, as, um, as you know, powerful and looking good, it's something that is, it just kind of like affects your psyche, right? It just kind of like, it boosts, boosts you up, right? So, um, and it's really, to me, it's really sort of like a dream come true to be able then to actually, you know, make these pieces into jewelry, into kind of like actual wearable art, because there is sort of like, I'm thinking of, um, uh, a book I've been reading called Aesthetics of Access by Gillian Hernandez. And uh, in it, I think there is a, um, a specific sort of like investigation of what is that, um, in what ways do people, you know, black and brown people sort of like present themselves, um, in what ways there's sort of like this kind of like idea of ornament, this idea of sort of like bling bling, this idea of um, still sort of like showing yourself as, um, you know, it, it, having a powerful aesthetic that is deeply rooted into, you know, what blackness is and way of being, right? And then I think for me, sort of like interesting to think about this because in many cases, when you are sort of like a brown or black person, you know, sometimes your hair is too much. You know, sometimes the way that you dress is too much. Your jewelry is too much, you know? So in order to sort of like reclaim, you know, and, and, and I would say that in many, in many ways, then um, this is sort of like put against then that uh, minimal, min, uh, minimalist and sanitized history of whiteness here in the U.S. context, right? Um, so um, to be able to... Um, to be able to sort of like stand, have that as a strong stance of who you are and who you believe with and where you're coming from, from, you know, sort of like a, as a legacy, it's sort of like, it's part of, you know, sort of like being and becoming constantly as we are here. Um, so I think that uh, the part for me for uh, in, in, um, in the names of is also then there is this, this other vein in which I have named each one of the pieces after black and brown women or queer people at the same time. So for me, there is a, you know, kind of like a formation of gender class um, concerning sort of like how, uh, in celebrating how then the aesthetics of, um, you know, the subject positions can be and should be constantly celebrated uh, for us. Um, and in the same way, you know, there is sort of like this embodiment and this uh, legitimate position in which we find ourselves in culture where there is a desire, a desire to, to be a creative conduit, uh, to be some, you know, a creative sort of like uh, subject. And at the same time, there's an admiration and there's a love back into uh, self-image and, um, you know, which both can attract gazes and at the same time can just refuse them as well. And I think that's my talk. <laughs> yeah, some water. <laughs>